Please help me welcome Barb Stulemer. I am really grateful that you are here tonight. I am tonight talking about just because you're an expert doesn't mean you have a business. I find that people who are starting a business, when they first start, they start for a couple of different reasons. And it's usually because they have an expertise that they're really good at and they, they know that there's a way that they can sell this. Whether it's an expertise to buy, or, uh, buy something, make something, or as a consultant. And they start out oftentimes working in a business where they're gaining the expertise over the years and they are becoming more of an expert at what they do. And because of something that happens in the business, it's either a downsizing or they're fired or they just don't like the business anymore and they want to get out of it and they make a decision, I'm going to start my own business. The second way I see people starting their own business is they're in a business that they really don't like. They're working at a job that they don't like and they've started something on the side. They have a little side hustle going on, they're making some money on the side and they're doing more and more of that trying to get to a place where they can let go of the job. So let me give you a couple of examples of how this looks. So Susan is a therapist who works in a hospital and has decided to leave the hospital and open up her own clinic with other therapists. Stephen is a plumbing uh, associate and after he has finished his um, training, he decides that he's gonna go out on his own. Todd is a window installer working for one of the largest window installation companies and on the side, on weekends and days that he's not working, he does installations of windows that the company he works for will not do. Dave is a firefighter and he gets five to seven days off in between his shifts and he wants something to do. So he created a landscaping company in the summer and a snow removal in the winter. Sandy works for a law firm and she knows the stress that can come with working in a high professional, high stress environment. And she knows what it does to people's health. So she's decided to take lessons and classes and learn about holistic wellness in hopes that she can help other people and eventually leave the law firm and do something completely different. And of course, Kathy. Kathy was downsized in her mid-40s and she wasn't really sure how she was going to transition the expertise that she had into a new career. And so one of the things she started thinking about when she was going through this process is, what is it that I'm really good at? Hey, you know what? My friends are always telling me, these cakes are amazing. Look at these beautiful cakes that you make. People pay like $80, $90 for cakes like this. You should be making these and selling them. So Kathy decides to open up a bakery. Do any of these sound like something that you might have done when you started your business? I get a lot of nods, a few hands. So the challenge with this is that when we start a business based on our expertise, we don't necessarily think about what we actually have to know for business. Because we think that we know enough in our expertise that we can actually sell that. And it's not enough. Have you ever, uh, when you started your business, did you have extensive, fundamental business training before you got into business? How many people had extensive, fund one person, two people? <laughs> because that's what you did in your job. And that's the expertise that you bring to some of the business that you do as well. And that's what happens with small businesses. We, we go into a small business thinking that all we have to have is our expertise. I've been in small business most of my life. My parents had a small business, my grandparents, their gra my great grandparents and back. And as a teenager, I worked for small businesses, many of them family friends. When I went to college, I worked part time and I would paint windows in the bars at Christmas time so that my sister and I, we would make money. And I got my education, I got my good job and I forgot about business. For two decades, I worked as an employee and I, gained the expertise that I needed to become better at something that I didn't know I was going to be doing. But two decades into it, my son got sick and I had to take 10 months off of work. And during that time, I couldn't just be a mom. <laughs> I had to do something else, so I took on an MLM. I signed up for one of the world's best MLMs. I got incredible sales training. 
I got incredible leadership training and I got an understanding of what was missing from my life. It was business. But what I knew was that was not what I could do. I had no passion around it and there was no technology in it because two decades in high tech and it wasn't enough to be just in an MLM. So I had to start my own business. 14 years ago, I started ClearCom Information Design for information companies, high tech, and medical device manufacturers. And that's where I started the technical writing for all different areas of business. Because I had already done this writing for two decades, I knew the different areas of business. And for the first six years, I put in about $50,000 into my own training to become a better business owner because I actually liked the business side better than the technical writing. I would hire people to do the technical writing and I would learn about business. All I wanted to do was help the, the companies become more successful. All they wanted from me was technical writing and that's when I knew I was in the wrong business. So nine years ago, I started my own business where I am a confidant and advisor to small incorporated businesses, their CEOs and their top management, helping them create bigger businesses. So I tell you this because I want you to understand why small business is so important to me. It's everyone I know, it's everything I do, it's the people I love. And I want to see them successful, but so many small businesses do not become successful and stay in business. So tonight I want to talk about three different areas about why experts often don't build a business that is successful. We're going to talk about delivery, we're going to talk about the myths, and we're going to talk about the must-haves. So first, the delivery. So the delivery is the component of your business where you are out delivering your services, whether you are selling a product, whether you, are ans uh, whether you are doing the sales, whether you are actually um, up speaking or you're out and you're doing your training, whatever that is, it's your billable hours. It's when you're actually getting paid for what you do. And it, some of the statistics shows that we spend between 20 and 50% of our time doing billable hour work. And if you start thinking about how much money you want to make if you're looking at a bigger business and 50% of your time is spent on billable work and the other 50% of your time has to be spent on something else. Because we all know that old roller coaster, when you're doing the work, you're not making the money. And when you're not doing the work, you have to go and find the new clients. So you're making money and then finding new clients, making money and finding new clients. And the idea for a growth of a business is to get the ups and downs to become smaller and smaller so that as you grow, you are making money but you're not making less money when you're not doing the billable hours. And that means you have to have systems in place and people working for you in the, non, in the billable hour times. Now let me make this clear to you. If you want to grow a business, eventually you have to be working less and less of the billable hours time. If you love what you do and you're thinking, I want a $2 million business, then you can't be delivering the one-to-one -one stuff as often. So you just, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a small business where you're just doing your one-to-one -one stuff. But I'm talking about the people who are interested in actually growing a sustainable, profitable, long-term business. And that requires leverage. I have a client who, his business uh, was close to the million dollar mark for a couple of years. And his biggest challenge was, how can he get past the million dollar mark? Like what was going, he had no problem getting up to, I think it was $925,000. No problem getting to that. He had 25 people working for him. He has clients across Canada and he couldn't get past the million dollar mark and we couldn't figure out why. So we sat down and we went through his whole business. What is it you're doing? What is it you're doing? What is it you're doing? And it turned out not what is it you're doing in general, it was what is you're doing specifically. He was going out to the client site still he was flying across Canada, he was showing up for days at a time, and when he was there, he couldn't do any of his CEO stuff. And that meant that the company couldn't move forward when he wasn't in his job. So when he adjusted what he was doing, it was um, by the next year, he had made and exceeded his million dollar mark. So the mindset is a little bit of a shift, getting to the place where doing the billing work is not your work anymore or less of your work, if that's how you're gonna look at it.
Growth requires an excessive amount of non-billable work. The expert stuff that you love to do that you brought into your business is not the entire part of your work. It's only 20 to 50%. That means 50 to 80% of the rest of your time needs to be spent on doing other things that take management skills, marketing skills, finance skills. You have to understand operations. You need support as a CEO, so you have to be out networking and, and have your inner circle of people you can talk to. Because one thing I, t I can tell you for sure is that if you are starting a new business, it's going to take longer than you expect, more money than you expect, and more energy than you expect. Because it's not what you expect to do. So the second thing I want to talk to you about is the myths. And I love this because we all come with some kind of idea of what business is, particularly when we come in as an expert. And so I have a whole list of myths. I'm only going to touch on three of them tonight. But the myths that I love um, actually make me smile when I hear people talk about them. So the first one is, I'm starting a business on my own because I don't want people to tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I want when I want, and I'm going to take time off, and I can go out for lunch. And yeah, you get it, right? It is incredible to think that, that we have that much control over our time. Now, yes, you don't have someone telling you you have to be at a desk from 9 to 5. You can choose to be there, or you can choose not to be there. You can make choices about your business, but I can tell you there is one person who is in control of your time and what you're going to sell and what the price is going to be and when you're going to sell it, and that's your client. Your client determines what it is that you have to do to be able to make money in your business. Because if you think you have a great product and you're going to sell that and people are just going to jump on board and buy it, you're going to be wrong because that's what you think, not necessarily what other people think. You have to know what your client wants. Um, what I found when I was doing technical writing in the CMS area, which stands for Content Management Systems, you don't have to know what it is, just know that nowadays it's the back end of almost everything that's online. 14 years ago, it was brand new. And there were thousands of companies vying for the position of actually having systems that were going to be used in a lot of the software that we have. And I wrote the help systems for three of these software companies. And what I found after years was only one of the three of them were still in business afterwards. Because what they have focused on was their expertise, the two of them. We have great software. They all had great software. It worked perfectly. It did what it was supposed to. It was easy to use. But only one of them did the marketing. Only one of them did the sales. Only one of them was focused on the other things that weren't their expertise. The second thing about the myths is when I make the money, I get to spend it. <laughs> Even when you're a sole proprietor, you still have to keep your business separate from yourself. Now, as a sole proprietor in Canada, the Canada Revenue Agency sees you and your business as a single entity. You have one tax form, and the money that you make in your business is technically yours, and yes, you can go spend it. But I'm saying if you want a business, again, that's profitable and sustainable and will grow, and maybe you can leverage it and incorporate it in the future, you have to put the systems in place and the habits in place that allow you to grow a business now. Which means that you have to be able to keep your business separate from your life. So my recommendation for this is to set up a separate bank account, set up a separate checking account, have someone do your taxes or your bookkeeping, and once a month, if you want to withdraw money out of it, set up a payment schedule so that the payments come out of there. If it's part of your expenses, you will already be used to how you're going to get paid from your business. When you're ready to grow, that will just roll into the next step. You don't have to think about how you're going to get money out of your incorporation because you're already paying yourself. It's already set up as the systems and accounts inside your business. The third thing I want to talk about with the... Um, myths is that I don't need a business plan. And I don't get as many laughs with that one. You know why? <laughs> I don't need a business plan. I hear that a lot because, and usually it's because I'm not going to the bank to get any money, so I don't need a business plan. 
And I understand because it's, it feels a little overwhelming to have to write a business plan. But I can tell you that a business plan is really important. The um, Statistics Brain Research Institute published an article back in 2014. And in it, they listed all the reasons why small businesses fail. And the number one reason at 46% was incompetence due to lack of planning. So when I teach at the college, and I did it this week, my students are the first semester entrepreneur students, and we talk about business plans. So why do you need a business plan? They go, because I have to do it in third semester. <laughs> OK, in your business, what is it that you're looking for when you're, when you're creating a business plan? Like, what, are you, what is in your business plan? And they like all look at me like, and I go, OK, so let's look at this a different way. If you're going on vacation, what is it that you need to know about going on vacation? And there's always that one person, the smarty. And he says, is there a beach? And I went, perfect, is there a beach? So yay, there's a beach in Barrie. I'll meet you downtown in, in an hour because apparently you'll be on vacation. And he looked at me, and you could see them thinking about it. Because when we go on vacation, we need more than just, is there a beach? Is it a warm beach? Is it an ocean beach? What country am I going to? Do I need a passport? Do I have to fly there? Can I take a train? Can I drive? What are the costs involved in staying there? What are the politics? Are the people nice? What's the food like? We spend more time preparing for a two-week vacation than we do, sadly, for a business that we hope lasts for years or decades or generations. If you want your business to last, you have to create a map that gets you there. If you want a business that looks like this, you need to know how much it costs to run a business like this. What are your expenses? Who do you need to help you? What do you have to sell and how much of it? And what are the markets that you have to meet to get to the business like this? And then the next step up from that takes the next, idea, the next general ideas of what else you need. OK, so three, we did the delivery, we did the myths, and now we're going to do the must-haves. And again, I have a huge list of must-haves. Many of them are in my book, but I'm going to touch on three of them tonight. So the must-haves. The first thing I'm going to say to you is you need to know how to write and read a business plan. <laughs> Not only do I want you to have a business plan, I want you to use it. I want you to understand why you wrote it. I want you to understand what components are in it. I want you to understand what it means to your business. It's not just a map. It tells you things about who's in your business, what the strengths are, how you're going to operate, how you're going to manage it, what the, what the money looks like going through there. So I, I believe that it's truly important that you don't just create a business plan, because there's lots of them online. You can just pull up a template and throw stuff in it, save it to a folder that you never look at again, and know that this is something that you've done. I have a business plan is not enough. The second thing is that you have to know the laws that govern your business. What are the federal laws that you're, you have to abide by? What are the incorporation laws? What are the provincial or state laws that you have to look at? What are the bylaws for your city? Can you have a business in your home? If you can, can you have people working for you in your home? Can you have cars parked outside your home? Can you have a sign outside your home? That's what the bylaws cover. There's a variety of different things that the laws ensure that you have to follow. And for small businesses, getting caught doing something wrong can cost you your business. Sometimes getting caught costs you a small fine of eight to 800 to $1,000. But that might have been your flight to the place that you had to go to get your $10,000 job. So don't get caught not following the rules of the law and the laws of your um, of your home. And the third thing is you need to re be able to read a finance and P&L statement. If you don't know your finances and what's happening inside your business, you don't know what's coming up. Who here has read any of the E-Myth books by Michael E. Gerber? Quite a few people. If you haven't read them, I highly recommend them. They're still very um, relevant. And um, start with the fourth book, and then go back to the first and read them through. So the third book that he wrote is The E-Myth Mastery. And in it, he speaks of, uh, tells a story of how his business failed. 
So when he was running his business, it was doing really well. He had 100 people working for him. They had millions of dollars of sales. They had lots of happy clients. And he had hired a CFO, an expert, to look after his business. That sounds all right. It, like you should have, like Meredith knows, you should have a bookkeeper and, a, and an accountant. So he's hiring a CFO to look after his business, and he's got this CFO looking after all the things that are going on, and he's like, we are just humming along. This is fantastic. Look, we have all these happy people working for us. We have all these happy clients. We have great suppliers. And one day, the CFO comes into his office. He steps up to his desk, and he leans on his desk. He goes, Michael, yeah? I got bad news. You're going out of business. He goes, what do you mean? We're going to be bankrupt by Friday. And I'm like, Michael Gerber's looking at him, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, and I quit. <laughs> so the expert that he hired to look after his business knew that there was problems, but Michael never knew about them. And you might think that that was the responsibility of the CFO, but Michael knew that it was his responsibility to look after his business. He never checked in. He never had meetings. He did not know what was going on inside his business when things were, were failing, when things weren't going right. At the time when they could readjust, he didn't know what was happening until it was too late. What I want to say to you is that you have to focus on the delivery of your business as being something that you look after at the beginning with your expertise, but figuring out how to manage offloading it so that you can grow your business. You have to look at them, uh, understand that a lot of the things you think about business may be myths that people have told you about, and that you can't just come in and do it the way you want, that there are things that will make it better for you, and that you, there are must-haves that you have to have in your business, you have to follow. So for my expect expectation of you is that as an expert, that you also become a business expert. Thank you.